The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Okay, those of you that are joining us live by video, <clears throat> you picked a great day. I got to share a testimony before I can even begin because it's that good. All right, uh, I've, those of you know that my son Jason, Pastor Jason's children's name, Emmy, Landon, and Haven. All right, well, anyway. No, I want to tell the story. <laughs> Jennifer wants Jason to tell the story. No, no, no. This is my moment. But late last night, they texted me, please pray. Emmy's thumb is in really bad shape. Landon accidentally closed the door, the jam, too, not just... <laughs> And her thumb swelled up horrible, and she screamed, and she was in a lot of pain. They text, please pray. And right when they texted it, I got a vision of when Jason was a little boy, and he came running to me, and I put my hand out like this, and my fingernail gouged his eye and took a huge chunk out. And my heart just dropped, and I went, oh, Jesus. And I watched it heal right before my eyes. Now, that was what I saw the minute they texted me. Well, in the meantime, Jason says, kids got to go to bed. Emmy's crying. She's in severe pain. And uh, they thought it was crushed. You know, closing a door jam doesn't leave any space. And uh, Jason took Landon up to bed, and they say their prayers before they go to bed. And he's never prayed this way before. Uh, <laughs> but he laid him down. He goes... He said, let's pray for Emmy. He goes, I see my Jesus, my Jesus. This is Landon coming out of me and in my bedroom. And he's going right through the walls. And he's going downstairs to Emmy's thumb. And she got healed. Is that good? So I, I think it's a sign and it's the beginning of something good for all of us in some way, shape, or form. But I knew that I knew that the way that text came late at night, and it was like that vision of what happened with Jason was so many years ago. Because he would have been about Landon's age or younger when that happened. And it just flashed in my mind, and it's like, this is going to happen again. And if it's going to happen again, it's going to happen again and again. So you need to start receiving miracle working power, physical healing, um, emotional healing, whatever you need. But right now we're going to begin to believe that God of the, uh, the miracle worker is going to start releasing this into our lives. And I think that'll be uh, on the third day. Huh? He will heal them. But... Uh, God's really laid it upon my heart. I want to continue kind of in the vein uh, that Jennifer preached. Uh, those of you know that she did a message on what do we do on the second day? Now, we know God builds according to patterns based on principles throughout Scripture. There's all patterns and principles. And it's important sometimes to know the ways of God, not just the Word of God. To know His Word, but to know that the, there's ways that He operates. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. But He does reveal them to us. Uh, if we would search for him with all of our heart. And he'll tell us things that we know not. All right. So Jennifer was on uh, teaching on day two, which very little is spoken of on day two. Uh, if you look at the pattern of the resurrection on the third day, there's a lot of third days, and Jennifer covered that quite thoroughly, all the Bibles at the third day. But it's like, what do you do on the second day? The first day, trouble. The third day, solution. Resurrection, deliverance, healing, wholeness. But what do you do on that second day? 
can make you or break you, can it? Huh? And there's nothing much written in the Bible about the second day. It's almost totally emphasized on problem, solution. But the in-between is what I believe God is even speaking uh, to us now, to learn how to do it, not just know that it exists. But what do you do during the second day? And uh, something that, that God was dealing with me on is that you know, even when other things pass away, when the gifts pass away, and, and there's three that remain, faith, hope, and love. These three. And, of course, the greatest is love. But faith, hope, and love, most of us in the church have heard thousands of messages on faith, thousands of messages on love, but very few messages on hope. As a matter of fact, the only ones that I heard, I preached myself. <laughs> but hope is like the second day. Faith is now. Hope is holding the heart open and staying connected with God till love comes through. And love never fails. But there's a prerequisite for love never failing. And that's knowing how to behave on the second day or in that middle period. Or faith plus hope. That sounds like a formula, but faith plus hope equals love. All right. And actually, faith worketh by love. Everything is love. But nonetheless, <clears throat> uh, the day of trouble, and then on the day two, as Jennifer taught it, the day two is the day of testing. It's the day of torment. It's the day of intimidation. It's the day also, though, of standing mm -hmm. and learning how to properly, biblically stand during that time regardless of external circumstances, regardless of the voice of the world, the flesh, and the devil, because they will be speaking loudly during the second day to get you out of really holding your heart open to God and getting distracted to some person, place, or thing that's like... Remember when we were teaching the children, one of the ways the children helped understand evil was that it's like a rat with a loudspeaker. And they understood that because they were singing a song, it's a big, big God and an itsy bitsy devil. And that's a good concept because in reality, that's what it is. You don't have to relinquish your power and your authority that was given to you. Satan operates on authority and power that was given to him by Adam. So it's legitimate. It was given to him. But he doesn't have to have yours. All power of heaven and earth has been given unto me. And I say, I give it unto you, the church. So the only way you can lose it is on that second day or in the middle, right? Abdicate. He, ha he can't take something from you unless you give it. And it's the second day that we need the most uh, understanding. So this is a message on the topic of hope, but I feel like it's even more important to know how to hope. Okay, you with me? I want you to know how to handle the second day. We've talked about the second day, that, you know, this is the period in between where you're waiting for the promise to be fulfilled. There's all kinds of trouble, and then there's the promise fulfilled. I think of Abraham offering Isaac up hmm? on the third day. There was a ram, uh, a ram in the thicket where God provided for him a sacrifice. But he had to believe that somehow God's going to just bring resurrection because he gave me a promise. And in the middle here, it's really hard to hang on to the promise because there's nothing, nothing that makes that promise even look remotely possible in the natural. And God wants you to stay in the spirit. And there's only one way to stay in the spirit as a believer, and that's hope. Hope keeps you open emotionally to the fruit of the spirit. Otherwise, those emotions will take you and draw you away. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, it will pull you into a different area. So here's where I wanted to start with the how-to, to understanding hope. And it was the way the Lord taught me 40-plus uh, years ago. These are the scriptures he used, but they have to become real to me for them to operate properly. And he used Psalm 131, verse 2. Psalm 131, verse 2, 
Now I'm going to read it from the Amplified Translation. David said, Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. It ceases from fretting. A weaned child, when a child is not weaned, it's demanding. And he's saying, David is saying with trouble all around him, battles all around him, turmoil all around him, trouble all around him, he had to first quiet his soul. If you want to make a connection with God, you cannot do it while you're hyper. You cannot do it without being still before the Lord. You don't even meet God except in your intellect until you've quieted your soul like a weaned child with its mother. What that's saying is my mind, my will, and my emotions, my soulish nature has been subdued enough for God to take the ascendancy. He doesn't want to do away with your mind, will, and emotions. He doesn't want them demanding. He doesn't want you runaway thoughts. He doesn't want you all frustrated with emotion. He doesn't want you pacing the floor. God says, and he, when he taught me with this one, I was a hyperactive per child. I was a hyperactive adult. He had to teach me to sit still. And you'd be surprised how many Christians never really learn to sit still. They will pray walking. They will pray in tongues because they can't sit still and be quiet. They will do. Those things are all good in and of themselves. But until you can sit and wean. What does that mean, wean? It means quit demanding in your mind, will, or emotions to rule and to quiet it. And I'll tell you what, when you get there, some people get there almost instantly the minute they close their eyes. Other people, it takes a while because their flesh is noisy. Mind, will, and emotions are like three bad little kids. And they all, they all want to do something and one will pull the other two. <laughs> you know? You know, the pacer will want to walk. The emotional person will go, oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh, 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 I've got a lot of things to do today. Oh, I got to pray. Well, you're not in prayer yet. You can be saying all the right stuff, but until you quit putting that demand on that flesh and enter into his presence, you've not yet touched God. Prayer has not even begun until your flesh has been weaned. Like a weaned child, there's no fretting. There's nothing overruling. I'm touching him spirit to spirit. I've quieted like a weaned child with its mother. I've quieted my soul. In other words, I'm comfortable in that relationship now. There's no demand that's getting in the way and interfering. Does that help? But that has to be an experience, not a mental concept. And if a hyperactive person like me could do it, anybody can do it. But I can remember sitting there going, I don't think I can take it anymore. <laughs> it was like Jennifer said when I was a kid in school. Okay, the teacher would say, we're all going to be quiet here. Nobody's going to talk. I'd be the first one to go, I can't do it. <laughs> all right. I'd rather talk than not talk. And God said, first thing I'm going to teach you, Dennis, is that I'm the teacher. And I'm going to awaken your ear morning by morning so that you can hear I'm going to awaken your ear, but here's what's going to take place. If I awaken your ear to hear, you shut up. I'm the teacher, you the student. And you don't get away with it in school, you're not going to get away with it in my spirit. When you go to school, you don't get to do all the talking. The teacher does all the talking, right? You can zone out, you can do whatever you want, but she's going to do or he's going to do most of the talking. And God says, with me, that's the same way. You, haven't, you don't have anything to say, Dennis, until you've heard something. Oh, that's humbling, right? I had a lot of stuff to say. He goes, yeah. Now, to be weaned is to stop the demanding. Uh, th this psalmist, what he was doing was in his relationship with Jesus. His relationship with God was, he was stripped of everything but Jesus. And it was just the two of them. Spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. That's a relationship. And when we become humble, calm, and quiet, we can then tell other people about hope. You can't tell somebody about hope 
if you're not connected, even in difficult times, if you're not connected to God, it, it, we used to always use uh, the emotional part, uh, perfect love cast out fear, uh, perfect love cast. You're not doing anything for anybody. If you're in fear, talent, quote, in scripture, well, hope is the same way. If you haven't found that place of peace and that God rule on the inside and haven't quieted your flesh, you can talk about hope all you want. And usually it'll be carnal. Carnal hope is actually most of the time negative. Like, how's it going? It's going good. I hope so. But that's kind of like, I hope so, but I don't really think anything is. I kind of expect the negative. Well, I hope. That's usually fear, doubt, and unbelief speaking and calling it hope. Biblical hope is you're in communion. You're spirit to spirit with Him. You're not being ruled by circumstances or distractions of any way, shape, or form. So, when we have become humble, then we can tell others. And that's actually what uh, verse 3 says right after Psalm 131.2, where it says, I don't have it written here. Oh, yes, I do. Right after he said, like a weaned child within me, my soul is quieted. The third verse is, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forward. He was qualified to tell them to hope because he was there. He was in the middle. He quieted himself between the trouble and the deliverance, between the problem and the solution. There's a middle ground. And hope is not taught enough. Hope is that middle ground. So we're going to cover a little bit about hope. Because to understand the functions of the spirit, your human spirit, we've got to get lordship in there or rule. You know, let the peace of God rule. Peace ruling is actually Jesus ruling. He's the Prince of Peace. He himself is our peace. Now, the two verses of Scripture that I've used over the years that God kept reminding me of to stay in that hope or that place of the ruler or lordship of Jesus. One thing to have as Savior, lordship actually takes practice. Practice will make permanent. <laughs> But here's the two scriptures, and I suggest you write these down because they're like reminders of how to get back where you belong. Proverbs 25, 28. It's kind of the negative side. Whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Which means what? If you don't have rule over your spirit, the enemy can come run roughshod over your life with every thought and feeling and impulse. I, I, that's why I like the message translation of the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down. In the message translation, it says, bringing every loose impulse, emotion, and thought into a captivity of an obedience by Jesus. Well, that's what we're saying here. Proverbs 25 says, if you don't have that rule, if you're not in that middle ground of holding the heart open, hope and open are very much synonymous open to the Spirit, open to the God emotions or the fruit of the Spirit. Am I going too fast, Jennifer? Okay. The fruit of the Spirit we call the God emotions because God gave you emotions not to be squelched and stuffed like a lot of church people think. God gave you emotions to experience the fruit of the Spirit. He wanted you to feel joy, peace, love. He wanted you to actually experience those things, not think about those things would be nice, but I'm pretty busy just stuffing everything. All right? And by the way, whoever has no rule over his spirit is like a city broken down without walls. And for those that think they're clever in the flesh, we use the example of walking in Walmart, walking down the aisle and seeing the last person on the face of the earth you'd want to see. Maybe it was somebody that just did you wrong. Down here, look what I'm showing. Come on. Every Christian knows what I'm talking about. You go, oh, there's so-and-so. That wall is not God. That wall is self-protection. That wall is illegitimate. That wall will fool you because 
while you put that wall up, oh, hi, Ralph, he's coming down the hallway. He just fired me last week and he's smiling at me. And I think he's gonna give me a cutting remark, but that's okay, because I've guarded my heart. And he gives the cutting remark. And what does the cutting remark do? Right through that wall. And you walk out of Walmart like that. Oh, man, oh, that bomb. Oh, then you stew on it the rest of the day. And you know what they said? They said they've got a lot of them. They're saying that I was a lousy employee. They shouldn't have been. Those walls don't work. You're like a city broken down and the enemy has access. This is a fake wall. When you guard your heart, you want to guard your heart, the only legitimate wall is peace. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind through Jesus. It's an impenetrable wall. It's armor, and it'll even crush the enemy beneath your feet. Don't ever think peace is passive or somehow you're laying down and being a doormat. Peace is a formidable force. It'll crush the enemy. The God of peace. Why did God even choose that in the scripture to say the God of peace? Why didn't he say the God of the heavenly armies of God will crush Satan beneath? No, he said the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. Gideon's army, beautiful story of a remnant victory that conquered um, an army and threw them into confusion. He appeared to him as Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. So with all of the victorious battling, his revelation of God was Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace. The God of peace will crush the enemy beneath your feet. All right, second verse. Now that verse 25, I had to practice that because there was times when you want to protect yourself and you have to repent of that carnal protection especially when it doesn't work. You're really only hurting yourself. It's like shooting yourself in the foot. Because when you put that wall up, anything that you were afraid was going to happen goes through that. And it happens anyway. You own it. It's like a wide open door. If you don't have any rule, and what's, what's the rule over your spirit? If you have no rule, the enemy can run roughshod. What is the only legitimate rule? Peace. In this church, if you say peace or forgiveness, you're almost right 98% of the time. So whenever somebody asks you a question, just go, peace, forgiveness, and you'd probably be right. Okay. The next verse, Proverbs 16, 32. This is a little different aspect of the same principle. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. The wrath of man has never worked righteousness. I've never been impressed with an angry Christian. An angry Christian is, in my book, not even a real Christian. An angry Christian is a Pharisee. The meanest people I've ever seen were religious people. When we were in Russia, we saw alcoholics getting sobered on the park benches instantly. We saw people getting physical healings. We were doing street ministry. They were doing mime and all kinds of different things. Everyone was open to the gospel of Jesus until the religious people came in full battle array. They had the black robes and the little black beanies. And, little... and you looked at them and go, gee, you wouldn't even need discernment. They looked demonic. <laughs> Look at the snarl on their face. The wrath of man never works righteousness. They are not Christian. They are religious. And there's nothing meaner on the face of the earth than an angry religious person. Don't Go to their church. All right. Now, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. You, th you know, I was raised in the south side of Chicago and took pride in the fact that our side was the tough side. I was a little squirt. I wrestled, but I was like 95-pound wrestler my freshman year of high school. And, but we would walk in with our school jackets into other parts of town, the more affluent parts of town, and I saw big guys get up out of their chairs so we could sit down. We, had, we brought that kind of fear in. But you know what I saw later on? All those tough guys were frightened little boys, just frightened little boys, bullying if you could get away with it. Of course, it did feel pretty good to be 95 pounds, walk in and watch the football players get up and give you their seat. But then they also knew how to, how to taunt. 
like uh, they knew we were from the more poor side of town. So they'd, here's the way they would get even with us because we were getting the girls. Those guys from the poor side of town were getting the girls, so they were getting really mad. <clears throat> yes, I didn't want to hurt my father's feelings. He got me a Corvette for high school graduation. and It wasn't what I really wanted, but I couldn't hurt his feelings. You know, <laughs> but all of that, all of that are games that people play, trying to jockey for position. And you know what? None of those games really work. For a believer, the only thing you need is the rule of God. Because those mighty, pushy people, tough guys, those who are slow to anger are better than the mighty. He who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. And the first illustration I got of that many years ago was... Uh, was it uh, Mark Anthony, uh, the great general? He could take a city and powerfully overtake any army, but if a pretty girl went by, he kind of got caught up in it and almost cost countless lives just because he couldn't control his own flesh. So you can be mighty but it would be better to be able to rule your spirit. He who rules his spirit is better than he that takes a city. Think about that. The next time somebody bullies you or you see someone who thinks that they've got all the answers and someone would just tell me about what we did in module four about even, even a, a controller. And Jennifer says, don't teach this, so I'm gonna teach it anyway because I'm old now. They'll, they'll forgive me. They'll look at my age and go, oh, you know, you're old, you know. But a real Jezebel, a real, a lot of times they have a fake composure. And I, I, I saw some of them become leaders that would submit to God. A lot of them just stayed Jezebels. Uh, in, in church as a pastor, you've got to know the difference between a strong woman and a Jezebel. There's a difference. Strong women, that's a good thing. And historically, I always thought Margaret Thatcher was a strong woman. There's some godly, strong women uh, that are not Jezebels. But a Jezebel sometimes wants to fake control because they have a control issue. And they'll say, well, did I say something that would offend you? And I learned a little something that is kind of fleshly and carnal, and Jennifer says she shouldn't be teaching this. But I found out that control, when it's not Jesus, when it's witchcraft, when it's manipulation, it's carnal. And if you're in the spirit and you're not doing it for the wrong reason, I would say, when they're, oh, what? Did I say something that would have harmed? I'd say, you're out of control. They go, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. <laughs> it's just just to show you that was God's way of teaching me what's under the surface really. You cannot go by observation or by... But don't tell someone who's busy being in control that they're out of control. And I'll push their button. Huh? But not that you're supposed to do that. But for me, it was a learning lesson to show you that control is control is control. And the only one you want to have control you is Jesus. Anything on your part is manipulation. It's of the evil one. Your yes is not yes, your no is not no, because you're doing something else, and that's of the evil one. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. Anything else is manipulation, and it's witchcraft. It's false control. But those that are slow to anger are better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes the city. So God created us in his image, and I want to teach on hope, but you have to understand how the spirit works. You've got to understand mind, will, and emotions need to be submissive. And there's games that you've learned to pray over the years to where you learn to stuff emotions. You've learned to uh, deal with thoughts by rationalizing them and making excuses. And you've, you've learned to deal with the, the willfulness or the impulsiveness. You can make an excuse for that too. As a matter of fact, I see it all the time in the world. Uh, impulsiveness is it's like a projection. Everything you're guilty of, just say they are. 
If you're angry, those hateful Christians, when you've got the hate problem, all right, get it? This projection. But what God's looking for is under the Lordship of Jesus, let the peace of God rule. Now, if God created us in His image so that the governing center of our personality was supposed to be our spirit, spirit first, soul, body, in harmony, your soul, mind, will, and emotion should be under the influence of the spirit. Um, our spirit rules and you're intuitive. You know, like when something's quickened to you out of the scriptures, that should rule over your thinking. You should go, ah, that I'm going to do that. God's speaking. Oh, his word, you know, his word the, out of the intuitive should rule over your thinking. The conscience, which is down here in your spirit, it's the voice of your spirit. And I sure hope it works with some of you. Your conscience is not here. Your conscience is here. Like if all of a sudden you, you did something knowingly wrong, it, eh, that eh, should be down here. Mm, oh, I don't believe I just said that. Mm. Conscience should rule over your choices. Right? And hope, hope, Biblical hope should rule over the emotions or communion with God. If your hope is open, then you have access to the God emotions of love, joy, peace, patience, the fruit of the Spirit. And that's why you have emotions, was for the fruit of the Spirit. Not to suppress them, not to put up walls. The only legitimate wall is peace. Any other wall is carnal. And it really doesn't work very long. It works for a little while. But what goes up will come crashing down. Now, if you're going to live out of your spirit, your spirit rules the reasoning mind. Conscience rules the will. How many can memorize mind, will, and emotions so that I can move along? All right? There's only three parts of your soulish nature. And you want your spirit to rule over mind, will, and emotions. And if you have doubt, read... Uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. to pulling down. Read it in the message translation. It said what God's doing is taking every impulse from the will, every emotion and every thought, and He's trying to form a life for you, that spirit. He wants those. He doesn't do away with them. He wants to rule through them. Conscience through what? Where does conscience affect? The will. All right. We'll test you on some other day. All right. The fruit of the Spirit, or the God emotion, should direct our emotions. Fruit of the Spirit directs our emotions. Conscience rules the will. And this is something you need to write this down and study it, because these three elements are in your life every day. You might as well use them properly, right? There's only three here. Come on, this is third grade level. Mind, will, and emotions. And all three of these should be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You need to learn how they're working in your life. Which one of those bad boys is kind of leading the charge? <laughs> is it the will? Are you willful? You're a mover and a shaker? You always get your way? You, you're in the grocery store and you push your cart in front of everybody else? Because you can't wait? That would be some needed work on the will. Emotion is either hot or cold all the time. Ah! Boy, they wear their emotions on their sleeve. I know I had two boys. One boy say, how's it going? Okay. Calm as all could be. That'd be Jason. Then I had Jesse. How's it going? Oh, man, you asked me how it's going. Let me tell you what my day was like. Oh, uh. Okay. I would say there needs to be some work on the emotional realm, bringing them under, right? Okay. And then the, the thoughts. Those people are always, I got a better idea. I got a better idea. They're, they're smarter than Ford Motors. They have a better idea. And they, let's, I don't know that I understand. Let's figure. Do you ever see anybody overthink something? And I go, you know, usually the simplest is the best. The simplest explanation is usually the most likely. Well, I don't know. I don't want to. You know what? That, that exaltation of the reasoning mind is at enmity against God. Did you know that? That's supposed to be submitted to God. 
His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. All right. I don't know if we're going to get to this message on hope yet. Um, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> but we know, we know that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when desire is realized, it becomes a tree of life. Who was promised the tree of life? Overcomers. So you have to overcome everything that happens in day two. From the onset of the problem to the deliverance or the solution to the promise fulfilled, you have to behave in the middle or you relinquish authority. And the devil runs roughshod over you and he has access to you because you're like a city broken down without walls. The only legitimate wall is what? Peace. So he can't run roughshod if you can... Keep your peace, and that peace is available. It's a matter of you walking it out. Now, if hope deferred makes the heart sick, uh, when I was uh, learning on hope and learning to sit still as a baby Christian, God showed me hope and open were kind of synonymous. If I held my heart open like, I don't know the answer, his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I don't, I don't feel anything except peace. Uh, I don't want to start fretting because when I fret, it changes down here. Hmm? So, and I lose authority. So I go, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm not. God says, Dennis, you're learning to hold your heart open till love comes through. Love never fails, but for love to come through, you have to stay open. Open. And hope can be somewhat synonymous. And the longer you cultivate learning to hold the heart open, it's like it gets fortified. It builds patience and endurance. And you learn to be steadfast and patient regardless of circumstances. And then you read the Beatitudes in the Amplified. Regardless of circumstances, you begin to function from that place of peace. Now, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Desire realized becomes a tree of life. The tree of life is you're tapping into the life of God, not your carnal life. Hope deferred means I shut down. I got tired of waiting. I have to figure things out. I got to do something. Can't do nothing. I got, I'm a mover and a shaker. right? And that's usually when you get in trouble. Because you, you're, you're in soul timing, not spirit timing. I, God rebuked me that time I was sitting in my office. I was a young pastor, and he just said, I'm Dennis, I'm not on Eastern time, Central time, or Rocky Mountain time. I'm on my time. And you're on soul time. In other words, I wanted to do it when I wanted to do it. I was upset because I would spend a couple hours in prayer, and I'd get phone calls during that time. Can you imagine the audacity that somebody would actually, should everybody know that Dennis is praying between such and such? And they have the audacity to call me then? And I get tense, and God said, see that tenseness? You gotta die to that. We're on my time. I'm in charge of time, not you. I had my life scheduled out. I had a day timer with every 15 minutes what I was gonna do in the pastorate. Boy, I, I Burn that book real quick. That didn't last very long. It was nice in concept. It was good time management. The trouble is, people interfered with it. And God says, and I'm in the people business. Uh-oh. <laughs> Something's going to have to be yielded and surrendered here. So, all right. So what's the bridge that links the fruit of the Spirit to the area of our soul? Hope. Holding the heart open. Now, persistence, and I, I really think this we're in the second day right now with a lot of things that are going on in this world, and particularly in its respect to Christians um, in general. Persistence is patience plus suffering. That's what, how it gets cultivated. Consider it, oh, everybody loves that. Uh, they have this on their refrigerator. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. 
that the testing, you got to read the rest of it though, that the testing of your faith produces something. And it teaches you to hold the heart open longer and be an overcomer and receive from the tree of life. It's for the overcomers, not the ones overcome, <laughs> victims. And so practice makes permanent. So persistence is actually the fruit of patience or holding the heart open, hope and suffering, meaning that what's coming at you is not pleasant. And this may last for a while. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. There's fruit to be gained from your holding the heart open to God. Now, in, in uh, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 13, But now faith, hope, and love remain, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Even faith, I can always remember my early teachings. Love is the mother of faith because God is love. So it's birthed out of that. But it says even when other things pass away, these three are going to remain, faith, hope, and love. So that means faith is now, and it's an inner assurance or a title deed, yes. My spirit's saying yes. But hope is I got to hold my heart open to that yes till yes manifests. And love never fails. Love will come through. But I have to relinquish my timetable too, don't I? That's the difficult part about the second day, is your timetable doesn't. And I think one of the most remarkable uh, things uh, about hope is it guards your heart and your mind. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 says, Constantly keeping in mind your work of faith, your labor of love. He's, he's complimenting the Thessalonians. I'm keeping in mind your work of faith, your labor of love, and perseverance of hope in the Lord Jesus. Your perseverance of hope. You kept your heart open. You didn't shut down. Hope deferred will make you sick. Giving up will make you sick. You think you're tired of holding the heart open. You're not doing it right. Holding the heart open is actually fortified. And it's like rebarb. It, it strengthens you the longer you do it and the more effectively the fruit that it produces. It's actually maturity. It brings forth fruit. Hope is the confident and favorable expectation of good. That's a simple definition. Hope is confident because it's, there's faith in there. Confident, inner assurance, and expectation that God is good. Now, if you don't believe God is good, this isn't going to work. Most people collapse and take matters into their own hands because they really don't believe God is good. But hope is the confident and favorable expectation of good. But I said I wanted to do some how-tos. If you're a note taker, write down these three words. Confidence, expectancy, and security. Doesn't the scripture say hope is an anchor? that goes behind the veil into the presence of God. Hope will keep you attached in the spirit. It goes into the holy of holies. It goes into your inner dwelling place. Hope goes behind and it keeps you attached to spirit unless you shut down, unless you close the heart. Because God's looking for this inner attitude of openness toward God, toward people, toward yourself. I am what I am by the grace of God. He pre-planned me, predestined me. I'm going to hold my heart open to that purpose that he has. Not my dream there's too much of this in the church where they're teaching young people, you just go after your dream. You just go to... You go after God and your destiny will take place. Destiny is better than some man-made dream. God might have you doing something other than what you think would make you happy. Whoa, that'll meddle with your flesh. Huh? But God is saying we can receive... 
and all the modules cover this. And I really strongly suggest that we have people that are learning our material and getting blessed by our material and they're watching YouTubes. That is the hardest way. Just to watch this message is the hardest way to learn what we're teaching. Modules one through five lay it down from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship like building blocks. Those of you that have had uh, ge uh, geometry, you know that it's how you start and you build on it. You don't start at the end. You don't take bits and pieces from a geometry book. You'll never make sense of it. There is a sequential order of walking this out. So I strongly recommend if you're, a, if you're strictly educated because you saw us on Sid Roth or you watch the YouTube, you can learn a lot of good stuff. I, mean, I don't doubt that one bit, but that's the hard way. I'd get on the online school and do modules one through six. You would have such a wonderful foundation that will save you years of trial and error because it does it from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship. So that's my advertisement for the online school, but really, modules one through six. And I've seen people go to counseling and pay huge amount of money. Our online school is inexpensive, very inexpensive compared. I've seen people pay $1,700, $2,000 for a two-day two -day workshop with a counselor. $1,000, you could probably buy every course on our school just about and be getting a lifetime's worth of material that you can access again and again, line upon line, precept upon precept. I doubt, you know, if you get as much as you could any other way. But openness to receive is crucial. You can only receive what you're open to. So God could be doing some good things. If you're shut down, you're not, you're not going to get, it's not going to penetrate. Hope deferred is like closing the heart. Day two, though, is holding the heart open before desire's been realized, before the answer came. What do I do before the answer comes? What do I do on that day two? Can you imagine what the disciples went through? Here, they're following Jesus with all their heart. They'd left everything to follow him, and he dies on Friday. Oh, yeah, he was resurrected, and they were, they were found a joy unspeakable, full of glory on resurrection time. But what about Saturday? Do you know the temptation of the flesh to shut down, reconsider, reason, reevaluate? How did I, this is not what I expected. You know, there's a difference between anticipation as a product of the Spirit, anticipating what God's going to do, and expectations of your own making. I've seen more people crash and burn with expectations. Expectation, in my terminology, I'm using expectation as a work of the flesh. Anticipation is a holding the heart open and going, Wow, I wonder how you're going to do this. I can remember having $12 in my checkbook and my transmission going out. A baby Christian, I don't even think I was spirit-filled yet. It might have been that early in, in, and I'm just going. This is where my relationship was, though. Destitute, $12, transmission goes out. That's like an impossible scenario. And I went, I wonder how God's going to work this out. That kind of reverential and childlike awe needs to be restored to each and every one of us. You get back to first love and that's going to be restored. If you don't have that, you don't even understand real spirituality. And the amazing thing was, I took it down by faith to the transmission guy to see what was wrong. He says, ah, I'm just changing the fluid here, $12, and I had $12.50 in the checking account. That'll be $12. I had a 50 cent balance. And I went, wow, but God got the glory and he got the credit. You can only receive what you're open to. And we really only experience what we receive. You only experience what you receive, but you only can receive what you're open to. Open, open, open. Hope is open. Now, Faith means, here's something that's important. If you're a note taker, write this down. I'm going to try to go slow with this because I think this could change your life. Faith means I commit myself to trust another. In this case, obviously God. 
Faith means I'm committing myself to trust another. That's faith. I got to trust them. I don't understand this, but I want to trust God. Hope means that I expect, that's that confident expectation, I expect that what I've committed to them will be responded to. Some people are afraid to trust. They say, I have problems with trust. Good luck, because that's baby Christianity. You will never know the love of God. Jesse Penn Lewis said that. You will never know the love of God if you can't trust. You have to trust Him before He even comes in. You have to believe that what I've been given to God, He can be responded to. And you're just going to have to say, if I have trouble with trusting, then you're going to have to say, God, I'm going to have to start learning how to do it then. Because it's an excuse. And it brings zero fruit. <clears throat> because that will force you to trust who? Yourself. Good luck. The self-confident rebel says there is no God. The fool is not a person who's got a low IQ. A fool is a self-confident rebel. Foolishness is to think you know better. Hope means that I expect what I have offered him will be responded to. And how do we look at it in the formula? Faith, I hate using that word formula, but faith plus being open or hope. I'm expecting that love's going to come through because the scripture says love never fails. I am not going to fall into the trap that God doesn't answer. Love answers, but he's going to answer his ways are higher than your ways. Don't get into an expectation. Stay in anticipation. Product of your spirit. Now, <clears throat> out of that, therefore I'm ready to receive whatever response he has because what I've committed to him, I trust him. Now, out of that trusting and expecting, the possibility for love's response will arise. Faith and hope and love comes through. Faith and hope and love comes through. Many people are afraid to risk because they aren't sure that God values what they offer Him. Wow, if that isn't a slap in the face if you think about it. I can understand being a little weary, but to, to think that God can't be trusted to respond to what I'm committing to him. I think it's about time we offered our body a living sacrifice, holy and accept, and that's just reasonable service. He is that loving and he is that competent to respond. We should always have this confident expectation of good. Romans 5.5, 5, hope does not disappoint. Hope does not disappoint. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's the proper station. That you might overflow or abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh boy. I'm going to have to cut this short. I'm only halfway done. You're going to get a part two, don't you think? Are you still with me? Is your heart open? Did you shut down? Anybody shut down? I want you to stand to your feet right now. <laughs> It'll make you sick. Hope deferred. Shutting down makes the heart sick. But let me just cover a little bit how hope works on the mind, and then we'll see. No? Jennifer's going, no. You don't get it because Jennifer said you don't get it till next week. You have enough right there on your little pad to deal with it. So I'm just going to close with the scripture that we will start with next time. And I love it. Romans 4.18, and this is in the New Living Translation, and I'm going to close with this. Even when there was no reason to hope, even, say that back to me, even when there was no reason to hope, Abraham kept hoping believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. He believed the promise of God. 
He believed in hope against hope because there's no reason to hope. He was old. God promised it, but I'm, you know what? I can't understand it, but I'm going to choose to believe him anyway. I, he's a good God, and I believe that, and you know what? God does things in ways that we couldn't figure out if we tried to figure them out. He did that with offering his only son. Then after years go by, and he actually in old age gets the son of promise, he's told to offer him. That reminded me of when God, when the joy lifted after I was a young Christian, it lifted. And I had no idea what did I do. Did I sin? Did I commit, oh, you know, the, uh, the unpardonable or what I didn't do? And God dealt with me. Do you love my joy more than you love me? And I went, oh, no. I said, if I never, and I never feel the joy again, God, I'm going to live for you and serve you all the days of my life. The joy came back. He wants your heart. He doesn't want your, your, your plans and your purposes. He wants you to find out what his plans and his purposes are for your life. That's where true happiness is going to be. Not blessing your endeavor. He wants you to find that you are pre-planned. So I'm going to read that one more time. Even when there was no reason to hope. Lord, write this on the tablet of our hearts. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. <laughs> Can you imagine how long he stayed open? Talk about his day too. That was a long day, too. What a day is, is a thousand years. A thousand years is the day to the Lord. Day two can be quite long, can it? What would the temptation be? Abort, come to your own kind, reason mind, figure a, figure a plan that might fit, that you can make fit, like forcing a piece of a puzzle that doesn't really fit, but you can force it in there because you're going to do it your way. Father, right now, God is going to begin remove moving the fear, doubt, and unbelief from a people. And we're asking even now, miracle working power is going to begin, even as it's begun in the children. We're going to see miracle working power flow to our physical bodies. God is a miracle worker, and I'm holding my heart open, and I'm not looking at a timetable other than God's. Hope against hope. I'm believing for God to accomplish His purposes in my life. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.